That's your t-shirt now, don't I? This is the Black Rifle Coffee Podcast. Prepare to get caffeinated. Welcome to the Black Rifle Coffee Podcast. I've got Mike Durant with us. Uh, I think most of you know who he is. He's a he's a really good friend of uh, Clay, and Clay's been on the show multiple times now. Uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and give everybody kind of the background as far as your bio, your military background. I read uh, your book, and I read obviously other associated books with you know, that the, the mission in Somalia or, or the combination of missions in Somalia, but it would be interesting to hear it from you specifically. So take it away, Mike. All right. Sounds great. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to, to be on. And uh, yes, Clay and I are, are very good friends. <laughs> I've known him since he was uh, a war not, you know, I, I'm sure you got into it in your conversations, but he was a Marine, yep. then he was a warrant officer, then a second lieutenant and retires as a, as a two-star general. And I've known <laughs> yeah. him since he was a warrant officer. So most of it, I didn't know the Marine part, but right. a- anyhow, uh, you know, it's, and it's guys like that, relationships like that, that I think uh, uh, are what uh, are, are most significant about your time spent in the military and harm's way and, uh, you know, other experiences. But I think right. for me anyway, in my life, uh, there's, there's two groups of people. There's the group, I kind of have in my personal world and then the professional world. And certainly uh, the guys that I serve with in the 160th are, uh, are in that very special group. Uh, right. And uh, we, we, we share a, a common culture and a common beliefs and values and, you know, think the same way about our country and everything else. So it's just, right. a, it's, it changed my life, honestly, but to, to get the, the clock rewound a little bit, I grew up in the Northeast uh, small town, pretty humble beginnings. My uh, parents were both blue collar folks. They b- both worked. In fact, I was talking to my mother just a couple nights ago. And, you know, when she was young, she did what they call piece work, which is uh, you're basically on a line making shoes and you get paid by the number of shoes you do something for. So, you know, that's the kind of upbringing I had. And, right. and you know, I, I always, when I think back on it, I didn't know the difference. I mean, I didn't know if we were millionaires or paupers, you know, and it was because everybody around us was the same way. And I, you know, we had lots of family in the area and uh, I was somewhat insulated from the fact that, you know, our, 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 you know, our place in the economic scale was pretty low, I, but I didn't right. know the difference, you know? So I have fond memories of, uh, of my, my childhood. My dad was in the national guard. So it wasn't weird to see, uh, him or other members of the family come home in uniform. He was a uh, NCO, his first sergeant of the really? local National Guard unit. And, you know, at the time, the Guard didn't deploy. The Guard is a whole right. different animal today. But then, yeah. you know, I don't even know when the last time the Guard had deployed. So, you know, he went on annual training, but he didn't, uh, you know, he, didn't, he obviously didn't go to war. He was a full-time guardsman. So that was the Oh, wow. The he was an AGR yeah, so, guy. Yeah. So he yeah. went, now not the whole time, but, but la- later in his career, he, he was a full time guardsman. So, I, in fact, I learned to drive a stick shift on a on an army jeep. It was the first <laughs> vehicle I drove that had a manual transmission. Um, so, anyway, uh, I found out about you know th- this opportunity to fly helicopters for the army. There was a a, a gentleman who uh, camped next to us. We used to go camping in the summer at a local campground and. He had a small business. He was a warrant officer, actually. Flew for the National Guard in New Hampshire as well. And uh, he asked if I wanted to go for a flight when I was about 14 years old. And I went for that flight. And I, I mean, I just couldn't believe it. I, I right. thought, this is a job. I mean, you could, you could <laughs> actually get paid to do this. And I, I guess I'm not the only one that he, I'll call it recruited, right. uh, you know, to get an interest in, in Army aviation. Uh, but it certainly worked on me. I mean, from the moment I went on that flight, I thought, you know, this looks a lot better than anything else I've seen so far. I'm not going to be a professional athlete. You know, I, I, I did okay in school, but I, you know, I wasn't right. all that interested in going to college and to be able to, uh, you know, find a way to get into that profession seemed like a no brainer. So I signed up for the army at 17, went to basic training. The recruiter told me I couldn't go straight to flight school, whether or not that was really true at the time. No one will right. ever know, but, uh, you know, they have quotas and they're, you know, so I, I ended up going into military intelligence. Okay. The language school at DLI, which is, 
not a oh, bad deal either. You in know, Monterey, so, yeah. <laughs> in Spanish, you know. And nothing, oh, wow. against, no, nothing against the folks who went to Spanish school, but it was hands down the easiest one. I mean, you got, you know, your, right. your roommates doing Russian or Chinese or whatever. Yeah. And you, you know, it takes them three weeks to learn the alphabet and you know, we have to learn two letters, you know. So <laughs> it was, uh, it was, it was a, a very interesting introduction to the military. They're all more like college, honestly. Right. It really yep. was. And then I went to Panama and uh, was in a, an intelligence unit down there. We did some cool stuff. I mean, we were monitoring various things going on in Central America and but I, I still wanted to fly. So I applied for flight school, got accepted, went after my time in Panama, and then uh, uh, got Blackhawks right out of school, which was awesome because Apaches weren't around yet. I, I'm sure had Apaches been around, I would have wanted to do that. Right. But you know, Blackhawk was the newest thing at the time. This is the early 80s, and I, I got the only Blackhawk slot in the class. So uh, I was uh, fortunate in that regard. Went to Korea, flew medevac, which I didn't want anything to do with at first. but from a pilot perspective, going to fly those single ship missions where, you know, you're bad weather mountains, you know, not a lot of time to react and, and, and it really forces you to mature as a pilot. So uh, it was in the end, probably the best assignment I could have got. Right. And that's when I found out about the 160th when I was there. And, and I'm assuming most people know the 160th, but the 160th is the army's special ops unit that flies, all the special mission units and Rangers, Delta, SEALs, yep. uh, you know, at least when I was there, uh, pretty much the only helo assets that they, these organizations had available. Right. And, uh, you know, that sounded awesome to me. So I thought, you know, I'll, I'll go there. So I ended up going to Fort Campbell. I spent some time in 101st, uh, where I got, you know, a little bit more experience, more night vision goggle time. Right. And then I applied for the 160th. And it's a pretty rigorous process. You know, I, I wouldn't compare it to BUDS training or anything like that or Ranger school. But, you know, it's there's a lot to it. It's There's physical, there's psychological, there's flying, obviously, and uh, PT tests, swim tests, all that stuff, psych evals. Um, it takes about nine months to get through the training. Wow. And, uh, and that's actually where I met Clay. We, we started flying together going through what's called green platoon where you yeah. know, you're training to go to the unit. Uh, and then once I got to the unit, same thing, you know, just met all my expectations. I mean, the first mission I go on is a training mission. We're loading up on C fives, flying to Thailand with the seals. They got their fast boats on board. Right. We're shooting in the jungle, their parachuting. <laughs> I mean, it, it was, it was just, uh, you know, all it was cracked up to be, you know, and I'm, we had relaxed grooming standards, which for me coming out of the conventional army was like, you know, wow, this, is, this is, you know, real, uh, real, real sexy stuff. And it was a busy time, you know, for a peacetime army for the time I was there, which was 88 to 93. Right. You know, I got involved in prime chance, which was the mining of the Persian Gulf by the Iranians. I got involved in uh, just cause, which, Mm -hmm. which I really wish was the thing I was most known for because that op was unbelievable. I mean, it yeah. really was. Well, that, that's, that's one I really wanted you to talk about, like, because I, I know that you were involved there and I, I, I think it's one of those things that it's been overshadowed by history in some circumstances. And so if you, if you want to spend some time on just cause and tell us what you did there, because I think it's a really, really uh, interesting part of history. Well, just in case we run out of time, then let's pause there and stay in chronological order. Yeah, yeah, so, good. So Just Cause, it was one of those ops that we really had been rehearsing for years. I mean, we knew that Noriega was a problem child. And right. you know, he had basically taken over the country. And, and things were on a steady decline in terms of relations with the U.S. So when something like that happens, you know, oftentimes this the special ops world, as you know, will will use that as a template for a, a joint readiness exercise. So right. we we had done you know variations on that scenario over and over, really, and it it all came together like clockwork because what happened was uh, Noriega and his thugs. I mean, they they were thugs. I mean, this guy was right. dealing drugs. He, I mean, he was doing everything that bad guys do. That you know you find it hard to believe that someone could could run a country and still be that corrupt, but but he absolutely was. And they they had arrested some American service personnel and actually uh I believe and I hope my memory serves me correctly, uh 
two were killed, I think, if if not certainly roughed up. And right. I apologize for not being certain about that. But, you know, it pretty sure they were killed, actually. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those things that uh, at the same time, he's making public appearances. And it's a fairly famous scene where he's doing the same truth, actual, actually saber rattling. I mean, he has yeah, a saber yeah. in his hand and he's banging it on the podium, bashing right. the U.S., right? So those two things together were sort of the catalyst to, all right, we got to get this guy out of power. So it was just before Christmas of 89. I still remember, you know, we had the vibrating pagers. It was before the era of cell phones right. and the pager goes off and we went to work and, and literally in less than 48 hours, we're taking down Panama. It, and it was the the ultimate, in my mind, special ops mission because yeah. we had an airfield seizure, which was down at Rio Hato where I yeah. was. The SEALs were taking out uh, Noriega's aircraft so that he right. couldn't flee the country. Uh, another element of uh, Delta Rangers and, and 160th was freeing Kurt Muse from the Modelo yeah. prison. So it was a hostage rescue. Right. Along with the other, all the other elements, like, you know, setting up, uh, you know, rearm points, fire locations, which is a refuel point. Yep. Uh, you know, it, it was the classic joint readiness training exercise operation. And, and yeah, there were a couple of things that didn't quite go so well, but it really went well. I mean, Kurt Muse got liberated. I just met him for the first time about oh, six wow. months ago, actually. Yeah. Where does and, he uh, live now? So he, he lives up in the D.C. area. I think he actually okay. lives in Virginia, Got but it's it. driving distance from D.C., which is where I met him. Right. And, you know, talk about a, a loyal special ops guy. I mean, he was in prison and he was yeah. liberated by, by you know folks from our community. So he is forever grateful and, uh, you know, oftentimes gets called upon to, you know, to speak and do this sort of things. And, uh, right. and he's got his own book, uh, Six Minutes to Freedom, which is worth a read itself for those who haven't uh, who are not familiar with that story. I'll have to I'll have to check that out because I haven't read that yet. Yeah, so just an amazing mission, and you right. know, uh, I I have a huge role. I was still fairly new to the unit, so my my job was a humble one. We were actually flying a Blackhawk loaded with fuel and rockets and minigun, right down the Rio Hato, which is where the airfield seizure was, and my job was to rearm and refuel the little birds who were providing fire support for the airborne drop. Right. You know, the, the significance of Rio Hato is it, it was the largest airborne drop since Vietnam. And I, I remember looking up at the one thirties as they're coming in. I mean, right. I don't know how many there were, but it was a lot. And the Rangers were just fall out of the sky like rain. And there was a triple a gun on the end of the airfield shooting at the one thirties. And I know right. they hit some, yeah, uh, but it wasn't super effective. I mean, we didn't lose any aircraft. Right. Um, but uh, it's also where the F one seventeen dropped the first bomb in its in its wartime experience. It's dropped the, it dropped a two thousand pound bomb, and that's what started the H hour. And it hit right at one o'clock in the morning. And then we had two Apaches with us also, which were brand new and they had never been utilized before. Uh, that wasn't quite as successful as everything else was, but uh, they got out there and, and they did their job as best they could. So, you know, just amazing. I, I, I was flying with Donovan Briley, who ends up killed in Somalia. He's flying yeah. the, the Super 6-1 bird with Cliff mm-hmm. Walcott in Somalia. And, you know, we were good friends, and we're on our way. Neither one of us has been in combat before, really. We've been, you know, we went the prime chance, but I wouldn't call that combat. And, you know, and this thing's about to go down, and we're looking at each other. It's like two minutes to one o'clock, and I'm like, okay, they're going to cancel. You know, there's right. no way we're actually going to do this. Right. And boom, that bomb goes off, and, and all hell breaks loose. And, uh you know, in, in a matter of a couple of days, we took over the place. And then Manuel Noriega ultimately does get captured. Uh, he was hiding out in, the, in in a facility in town, but he finally gave up. And then Cliff Walcott, who uh, is killed with Donovan in Somalia, is the pilot who flew Noriega out of the uh, where he was hiding to the to the tail of the C-130 to fly him back to the States. Right. So, you know, I, I, as I've said many, many times, I, I kind of wish that as you as you said, that that mission got more attention because it was a classic. It really, really yeah. was. And it went, went well. We're doing, it would be interesting to, to see if, uh, if you want to do this with us because we're, I'm going to Panama to do these, uh, I, I, I do these coffee trips in Panama and I want to take a bunch of just cause veterans down there and go to Rio Hato. And cause we're, we're, we're going up into the mountains, we're sourcing coffee. But what I think would be interesting is, combining some just cause guys, putting them in 
some of those places where, you know, out on the airfield or some of the other places in town, and then telling the story of where they were as, you know, I'm going out to source coffee because I've, I've never actually, you know, obviously I've, I joined the army much later than just cause, but it's one of those stories that I think would be so interesting to hear from the Rangers perspective, from the 160th perspective, from the 82nd, and then talk to the Panamanians that are still there and kind of look at both sides of it over a cup of coffee and then talk about it. So if you're interested, I'll, I'll hit you up after this and tell you when we're headed down. You might coincide with your schedule or you might know somebody that might want to go down with us, but well, I definitely yeah, want to tell be, the story. That would be cool. That, that is a neat idea. That, that would be uh, really neat. And Kurt would probably be interested in, in going as well. I'm not sure, but... Uh, that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I'll uh, send him a note and I'll let him know what you got going on. Please do. So Just Cause, that takes us to the next, so the next, uh, the next piece in chronological order, which is what? Desert Storm. So... Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously that that kicks off in uh, in January uh, of ninety one. Ninety one, right? yeah. Make sure that yep, my time is all correct. Yep. And you know, initially, our mission was going to be to to liberate the hostages because they right. had taken hostages in Kuwait, mm-hmm. and they were holding them from the the hostages from the embassy. So our that was our mission. That's the one we were rehearsing, and we spent a couple of weeks rehearsing that. And a uh, pretty big op. I mean, obviously, it's going to start the war. That, right. that we're going to, you know, cross the beach, drop the bombs, shoot the bullets, and uh, and the war will start as we're liberating these hostages. And you know, I still remember it's one of the most uh, proud moments I think because the intel folks did not think that mission was going to go very well. They they were they were going to be hard to get to those guys, uh, and they they anticipated pretty heavy losses. And not a single person seemed to hesitate at all about that. And I just always been impressed by that, that, you know, there was not, not a person saying, man, this is nuts. You know, we, we, we really shouldn't do this. It was, you know, these are Americans being held against their will. This is our job. We're going to go do it. And uh, right before we thought we were about to deploy, they let, they released the hostages. So it's a sort of a, you know, it felt great that, you know, this, it, it resulted in a, in a peaceful, positive outcome, but right. sort of feel, felt like we got cheated out of our, uh, our, out of our opportunity to, to really do a, a true kick-ass special ops uh, hit. Right. So then it's like, okay, we got to find a mission to do, right? Because that's what everybody wants to do when, it's, <laughs> when there's conflict. How do I get right. involved? So yep. uh, it evolved to the SCUD missiles. So yeah. those who, who remember the Scuds, they were pretty strategically significant because Saddam Hussein was trying to use them to draw Israel into the fight. And, yeah. and the reason that was significant is this was a coalition force mm-hmm. which had the support of Arab nations. And if Israel now joins the fight, that potentially could break up that coalition because right. of the conflicts that exist between those nations. So the last thing we wanted was Israel to get drawn in. He knows that. So he's shooting scuds from Western Iraq into Israel. So our mission becomes, you know, with, with the ground units to deploy there uh, and live in a place called Arar, which is way out west. I mean, it's pretty far west, northwest Saudi Arabia. And we're primarily supposed to just insert the, the special mission units. And they're going to, you know, using their ground vehicles, find these vehicles, uh, these scuds and dismantle them. But you know they're range limited. So once we yeah. once we get them on the ground, they can't cover a huge expanse. And there were a couple of times when we were in flight and we got intel on locations of Scud launchers. And the first time it happened, I happened to be flying, and right. we were flying escort. So we were flying armed Blackhawks at this point. We had armed up the Blackhawks. Pretty limited, unfortunately, at that time frame. We only had miniguns and rockets on there, mm-hmm. which is, a, you know, rockets kind of a close-in weapon, as is a minigun from an yeah. aerial fight perspective. Right. But, you know, we still got weapons, so we get diverted to go attack this scud. And I had the working SATCOM radio. I was not the flight lead, but because my SATCOM radio was working, the other guys was not, we ended up leading this attack. And we rolled in on this thing, and I always tell people it's like seeing the most gigantic 
buck you've ever seen in your life standing broadside. I mean, there it is out, <laughs> out in the desert, stationary. <laughs> but it would be like that buck, you know, you yelled at it and it didn't move. You know, I right. mean, there was something unusual about this thing because right. it was all by itself, no support vehicles. I mean, it looked absolutely real. And, and we shot at it. And we took great video of it. In fact, it was it ended up being a, a page on the SOCOM calendar in future years. And if you looked at that picture, you'd say, oh, yeah, that's for sure. That's a scud. Right. But there was some speculation later that maybe it was a decoy. And I, I don't know in the end whether or not uh, we actually contemplated going back in with Chinooks and slinging the thing out right. to, uh, you know, to prove or disprove what it actually was. But that that mission never got approved. But that, that would have been kind of cool. But uh, I ended up with some gun problems. That's a, a very frustrating story, you know, about how sometimes technology lets you down. My, yeah. uh, my gun system malfunction, uh, which caused for some high levels of frustration and a little bit of ridicule from the guys when I got back to the back, because everybody wants to say, you know, right. you screwed it up somehow and it wasn't your machine, but <laughs> right. in the end, it absolutely was the machine. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, the, the, the war starts to cool off after we probably flew, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 missions, either, you know, inserting ground operators or attacking scuds or other things. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, things cool off. We redeploy back home and then Somalia the following year, uh, right. 1993. And most people are familiar with the story. You know, I probably don't have to get into too much detail. It's a, uh, Hell of a firefight, that's all I can say. You know, we, we figured just the aircraft fired like 175,000 rounds of ammunition. I mean, it was wow. it was just uh, 18 hours of pure shoot fest. And uh, in the process, five Blackhawks get shot down. We had 74 wounded, I think, uh, mm -hmm. 19 killed over, you know, two days. And, uh, you know, I ended up getting captured. Somehow survived it. Most people are really familiar with uh, the story and specifically the gunfight. You know, one of the things that I'm really interested in is, you know, being held in captivity against your will. Uh, you've probably had a lot of time to think about your experience and then be fairly introspective as to what were the biggest lessons learned? What are the big pieces of wisdom that you, you were able to take from that experience? Uh, you know, enlighten us as to what do you think and reflect on based on that experience in your life? So I think the first thing is, you know, survival school, right? So we, we, right. we in the 160th at the time were the only army aviation unit uh, that went to flight or to survival school. Right. And it was the, uh, the SF part of the SF qualification course that we went to. We, not everyone went to that, but that's what I went to at Fort Bragg. And uh, I think at the time, you know, you think, it's good training. I mean, I always said it was probably the second best training I went to in my whole career behind right. flight school, but you'll never use it. I mean, whoever thinks that they're ever going to use that. And right. then all of a sudden, you know, what, what was it that they, they taught me? What, how is this supposed to work or what can I do here yeah. kind of moment? So the, the one lesson learned for me is, you know, never miss an opportunity to get smarter on everything. I mean, it doesn't, you just never know, you know, right. and, and I, I've talked to, you know, kids in school and you try, you obviously try to relate to them. And it's, I, I put it in terms of, you know, math, right? You, you probably don't think that some of what you're learning in this class is ever going to be used. And for a lot of you, it might not, but, but right. for some, you know, it'll be very valuable in the future. So really put all the effort you can into learning it because this is an opp opportunity for you to, to take advantage of something that, you know, not every kid gets a chance to, to experience. And, right. and I think that was number one is, is I, I went to, to survival school and then I just put it on the back burner and I just thought good training, never going to use it again. So, <laughs> you know, failing to truly appreciate that I think was number one. And then, and then just how the things that I did remember, which are just more general in nature, how effective they work. You know, that's the feedback that I gave because there's not a lot of us. I mean, there's, there's only a handful that have actually been through that course that have then been held, uh, you know, by the enemy. So obviously right. they were very keen to, to know what worked, what didn't. And, you know, and again, it's not to say it would work against, uh, you know, Chinese or, you right. know, somebody like completely different, but in that, 
type of environment was all very, very effective. Um, there were obviously a lot of very emotional moments. Right. And for me, when I was deployed, the operational side was not the hard part. It was when things were quiet, you know, where you had a lot of time to think that you weren't home and it was your kid's birthday or whatever, you know, yeah. when, you're, when you're flying or on an op or something, you're just not thinking about that stuff, you know, but so unfortunately in captivity, there was, it was almost always time to reflect and, and think about home. Mm-hmm. But I tried to use that as a motivation because, you know, I left, uh, one day before my first son's first birthday, he, right. my parents had just flown in actually for his first birthday and we deployed. And uh, so, you know, I, not only for my sake, but for his sake, because, you know, you know, it's important for kids to have parents uh, that love them and care for them and a whole, and a whole family. So I sort of, sort of used that as motivation and, and I don't know, you know, I've always tried to explain to people 11 days is nothing when you compare it to what some of the Vietnam POWs went through. I can't, I, you know, I've been in captivity and I can't understand right. what that must have been like. But, you know, when it's day five, you don't know it's day five of 11, you just know it's day five. So it's the same, you know, my day five was the same as their day five. Right. And you have to kind of get yourself in a mode where I can't even think about how long this is going to last. I just got to think about, I'm going to get through this one day at a time. And, and, you know, you've probably heard that before. It's a bit of a cliche, I suppose, but in that environment, that's the only way you can survive. I mean, it's, right. I can't worry about next week. I got to, I'm going to get through today. And there was times when I could get through the next 10 minutes, you know, just because it's so fluid and dynamic and could go either way. So it, it's, it's a, uh, but it is useful information. I think in, in sharing with people that, it is an effective way to get through challenging times. I mean, yeah. you know, if, if you've got, you know, I think about the folks in Kentucky, which is just north of Fort Campbell that just experienced yeah. these horrible tornadoes. I'm sure when they woke up that morning, it's like, I, you know, I can't go on, you know, I mean, my, everything in my life is gone. And you, you basically just have to say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to build this new house one brick at a time. You know, I'm going to figure out how to get it done and, and somehow we'll get there. And, and it's just a sort of philosophy on survival in life, I guess, which is, right. I'm not the only person to ever say it. All I could say is <laughs> it works, you know, it yeah. really does. Yeah. I, I, so I, I often, um, think about things and I, I'm just wanting to, to ask your perspective, which is, you know, when you've, when you've been through significant and challenging events that are both emotionally and physically challenging, right. Where, you know, you have really bad days. Uh, you've had some bad days in your life. And you know, I've had some bad days in my life. And those bad days are much worse than 99.99% of, uh, I think, the American general public. Uh, so for me, the way I look at it is those are days that I've used to motivate me in, in the rest of my life where I think, you, you know what? We're not risking life, limb, or eyesight here. I'm a little bit tired. I get to go home and read my kids' stories. Uh, the rest of this, the rest of this stuff is gravy, man. <laughs> and and do you do that? Do you has that given you perspective in your life? And do you reflect on that time? And does it motivate you? And I guess you know that's the that's the question. Does that motivate you, or do you try to just block it out and move on? No, I think, I think it absolutely motivates me. And, and I think it was more profound early on because, I mean, it's been right. almost 30 years. So yeah. in some respects, it feels like a different life. But um, early on, it absolutely motivated me. And, and, and I think it's, there's another element to it is it's a bit of a miracle that I survived. I mean, yeah. it, more yeah. than a bit. And, and I always said, I can't squander this gift. You know, yeah. I mean it's truly a second opportunity at, at life. And, and it's not just for me, you know, I mean, I, I look at the guys who, who, who we lost and to me, in many ways, I represent them. You know, I, I, I'm the voice that's still here that can speak on their behalf and talk about, you know, how great they were, how great the unit was and, and keep their memories alive. And I want to do that in a positive way and obviously not a negative way. It's, right. and it's easy to fall into that negative trap. Uh, 
you know, I, I was grounded and I could have complained and said, hey, you know, the army screwed me over and, and, and you know, have a bad attitude. But instead, I, you know, I, I found a way and, and I, I got back on flight status, uh, you know, by beating the system. And, and when you when you do win and you don't always win, but when you do win, it feels great because, you know, it's like I took on this challenge. I overcame it. And now here I am. And and then, you know, for me anyway, it's been, OK, what's the next one? I guess that's the that's the downside to it. So I'm not sure I could ever be satisfied. My wife just told me the other day, she said, you're one of the few people I know that is just not happy. She used the word sitting in a box, you know, right. and, and that's that's not meant uh, literally, but meaning I'm kind of always looking for what's that next level. Right. And it's interesting that you say that because I was, I have this conversation with, with, with people a lot, especially people trying to figure out what it is that, that motivates me or, or, you know, and not necessarily me, but I think there's a lot of veterans that are, that are share a very common circumstance, especially when you've been through combat and you've been through you know, multiple different rounds of combat. Um, and I always look at this as, is this is a gift that keeps on giving, right? So I, 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 I was lucky. Like I was super lucky. I've got all my fingers and toes. I never take that for granted. It makes me hug my kids more. It, it makes me spend more, you know, valuable time directly connected to them emotionally because I just don't take it for, for granted. The fact that I'm here is a gift that keeps on giving. And it also, the, the friends that I've, I've had, and, and I think the, the really close friends of mine, they are a perpetual amount of motivation for me because I get to do something that they can't do, which is I get to plug in and connect with my family. I get to come in and be in the office and be an active participant in growing a business and giving back to the community and doing all these great things. So it's interesting to hear you say the same thing because I think there's a lot of us that feel very, very much alike which is I'm having probably a lot of the same feelings that you've had. And a lot of those motivations are probably some of the same motivations that you have. Because I know you went on to build a, a very successful business, which I, I really want to talk about too, because your post-service is, I think, something that you know, you've talked a lot about uh, your military experience. And a lot of people know about your military experience, but I don't think a lot of people know about what you've done after the military, which I find just as fascinating, actually. So I'd love for you to talk about what happened after you got out. When did you get out? And then what was that journey like in your transition? And then how did you find your footing back and where you're at now? Yeah, I, I agree. I think we have a lot more in common than I, than I thought than I thought we would coming into this. <laughs> but uh, so I retired in 2001. I stayed at the unit. I, lo- I, I love the unit. I mean, I think yeah. everyone's ever been there. Right. Has, you know, a, a bond to that organization that uh, is hard to break. Yeah. And uh, I stayed till, till 2001. And then I was fortunate in that I had gotten involved in what the military department of defense calls acquisition, meaning mm-hmm. the process by which you buy stuff, right. you know, goods, services, whatever. And that really set me up well for the transition. I think a lot, what, what hurts a lot of folks is they go straight from, I'm an operational guy, gal. Now I'm in the civilian world. And I think that's a, a lot are very successful with that because they bring a lot of tremendous talent, yeah. but it's, but, but that's a harder transition than I had. I, I, mine was more gradual. I sort of learned the business side from the DOD perspective mm-hmm. and then, then retired. And I worked for a couple different companies and I ended up in a large business and I really didn't like it. I mean, you know, there's people that thrive in large businesses and, and good on them. I, I'm not criticizing them, but for me, it was not the right answer for a lot of reasons. And you, I don't want to. I don't want to spend the next five minutes complaining. It just didn't, it just didn't work. All right. And so I thought, all right, I got a lot of really good experience here. I had been blessed to work for a small business that I really enjoyed. I liked the culture, and I thought I can bring that band back together. And yeah. uh, and, and that was. If you ask me, you know, in a sentence, what was my business case or my business strategy was to bring the band back together. It was 
essentially to try to take the culture from the special ops world and, and bring it to life in the civilian world. Same values, same commitment to the mission, same you treat people right, you know, same, you know, there's not this stratification of the senior leadership down to the employees. I mean, it's we're all in it together kind of thing, you know, and and I mean, I think largely we've succeeded. It's hard to do because, you know, not everyone comes to work for the same reasons. But right. but I think to a great extent we have accomplished that. Yeah. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, you know, selling to the federal government is a slow grind. A lot of people fail because you can't survive just the ramp up. It takes yeah. forever, you know, and especially now under COVID, it seems like everything's gotten, if it could even possibly be slower, it has gotten slower in terms of, you know, awarding contracts and things. But, you know, we, we, we were successful, made good decisions, hired good people, went after the right opportunities. And we've slowly built and built and built and built. And today, uh, you know, I'm proud of it. I mean, we, we, we will have almost, uh, you know, a workforce of actually over 600 people here shortly. Uh, we've got people all over the world that were in 16 locations. Uh, we just got a new, a pretty big contract in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, we're, we're an aerospace and defense company. I mean, we, right. we pretty much do everything in aviation except build the aircraft themselves. We do everything else. We fly them, wow. do engineering, maintenance logistics, uh, all, all of that. But it started from humble beginnings. I mean, it was, as you could probably attest to yourself, you know, you don't wake up and all of a sudden it's a, you know, it's this gigantic yeah. success. You, you got to, it's one small success at a time that slowly builds over time. You know, I mean, the first contract we got was two people and one of them was me. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm working full time and then trying to grow the business after hours. Right. Because, you know, there's a lot of other stuff that goes on beyond the eight hours a day that you're working for that customer. So, uh, you know, it's great. And, and people also don't think about the fact that, you know, I had to put my house up as collateral to get the business loan, just to, yeah. to be able to pay for what we had to pay for uh, in the first nine months and mm -hmm. easily could have failed. And I, I sat my kids down. They were, they were all young, early teens for the most part. And they still remember this. And it's kind of a classic in our family. I said, dad's going to go do this. I'm going to, I'm going to quit my, decent paying job that I don't like and take a swing at this ball. And if I miss, you know, unfortunately I got to put the house up and, and we might be living in a box, but they said, you know, well, we believe in you, dad. And, and, uh, and fortunately it, it, it all played out in the end. It's, it's so far beyond what I ever thought, which I'm sure you would probably say the same thing. You know, I, I never envisioned we'd get to this point and now we're trying to decide, you know, how do we take on the big boys? Because that's the world we live in now, you know? So the challenges never stop. They just change. Yeah. But you and I, we do. We have, we have, we have a lot of similarities and I didn't, I didn't think that starting this conversation either, but the, the, when I started this company, I wanted to take the same type of meritocracy that we had in this special operations, a small team room, problem solving, you know, the complex problem solving, creative course of action development, and then may the best idea win type atmosphere. And then apply that to the business scape uh, where I could still be in a team room because I'm not good at transitioning. I tell everybody that. Like, I'm, I'm not good at transitioning. I can't, I can't leave the team room, actually, uh, because it's just psychologically not comfortable for me. <laughs> so I have to have the same type of camaraderie, the same type of team building, the same type of problem solving. And I want to take that and I want to transition with that, that, that same type of force and then build a company around that where I could establish my own, my, my own island or my own ecosystem because I didn't, I didn't want to work in a, in a big corporate environment. That, that, that When I worked at the CIA, that was like one of the things I really didn't like was there was big corporate infrastructure with a lot of bureaucracy. You, there, there, you didn't have a lot of entrepreneurial problem solving that was going on there. It was like big corporate entity. And uh, that was really what, what motivated and inspired me to, to do this, the, the, you know, the coffee company. So this, to hear you say that, that's the, that's the first guy I've talked to in, in, in seven years. It's like, I want to take the special operations mentality and then apply it to business. And it's the same thing. My kids were too young. I didn't have to sit them down, but I sold 
I sold everything I had. I, I literally, if it was not, if it was valuable and I could sell it, it was sold. And I, I, I told my wife, I was like, this is going to be hard. And if I fail, <laughs> if I fail, you know, we're kind of F-U-C-T, hard T at the end. Uh, this could be hard, you know? And yeah. she was like, ah, we'll be all right. You know? And, uh, uh, and yeah, I sold it all. I sold uh, a house. I had a condo in Seattle. I had another house in Colorado because I'd kind of moved around and bounced in different locations. And uh, all the guns out of my safe, all, you know, the safe, the guns, like everything. I sold down, I sold every piece of kit that I had. And I keep a, I keep a mag pouch uh, that's in a shadow box above my desk in San Antonio because it was literally the last piece of tactical kit that I owned that I didn't sell on, on like eBay or anything else just to power this thing. And mm. so hearing you say that is, <laughs> it's, it's so similar. It's like, it's shockingly similar actually. Well, I think you've done a better job than I have because I, uh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't say I, I feel the team room uh, environment. Uh, maybe, you know, we, we've just gotten to where I, it can't be that way. But, yeah. you know, I try to keep it. I think I feel it among the senior leadership team. I mean, we're pretty close and, and yeah. we don't have a lot of turnover. Right. Um, and I think everybody's really committed to to the mission. But there definitely is, unfortunately, this sort of separation between me and, and, and a lot of folks, not by design. It just, right. uh, you know, it's at some point you can't, your span of control and authority can only go so far and then it's going to, you know, trickle down. But, but I, I think we've done pretty good. I really do it. And uh, so another element to this, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with e ESOPs. You ever, have you ever heard that term before? Employee mm -hmm. stock ownership plan? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, we're in the middle of that right now. So in the right. end, what will happen is that the company will be owned by the employees. And uh -huh. it's the most elegant way to depart that I have been right. able to find. And uh, I'm, I'm really proud of that because... Psst. Kayla, <laughs> did you know with Black Rifle Coffee's Coffee Club subscription, you can get fresh coffee shipped to you every month? You don't even have to go to the store. Whoa. You don't even have to leave your bed. What? Wow. How did you get in here? You might want to go ahead and join the Black Rifle Coffee Club subscription before one of these guys shows up at your place. It doesn't, you know, it's not like a traditional buyout where the yeah. whole leadership team gets swapped out and people get fired and you know, there's no more snacks in the break room kind of thing. You know, <laughs> right. it, it, uh, it, it's, you know, it's exactly the same. It's just ownership changes from me to them. Right. And uh, it's complicated how it all works. You know, the first time you hear about it, it's like, that can't be yeah. because they don't have to buy it. It, it ends up, being given to them over time and they're, they're right. rewarded for performance and, and longevity. And, and, uh, uh, I'm a big proponent of it. And I, I, you know, so far for us, it's been a huge success and, and that allows me to then move on to the next phase of my life. Yeah. So, and the next phase of your life is, and, 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 you know, I know because, you know, Clay, and I think you've announced, so where are you, what are you departing to? What's the next phase of, of your life, Mike? Well, this one, I didn't see coming. This one was kind of like the RPG, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it came out of nowhere. Uh, you know, people have asked me over the years, hey, have you ever thought about running for office? Because, you know, name recognition is a big part yeah. of, of you know being a political figure. And I, my quote always was, I don't like the politics of business. I can assure you I won't like the politics of politics. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and that was my position. Seat opened up, and the candidate pool was not looking all that solid. And right. you know, this country—I don't want to say it's in trouble because you know I'm sure there are many, many times over the course of history where people my age and I'm 60 now would have said the country's in trouble. You know, it's not like it was 20 years ago for whatever right. reason because it's changing. It always has changed. Yeah, but there are things that 
are somewhat troubling that maybe I can help fix. You know, maybe yeah. you take this thing, same thing we just talked about, this special ops mentality, and take it to 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 the government. You know, take yeah. it to politics. I don't know if it'll ever work because talk about, you know, people that are not committed to the mission. You couldn't find right. a better set, you know, that, that defy that logic. But, you know, I, I talked to my wife first, just like I sounds like you probably would have yourself and just said, hey, it's not our style. Uh, what do you think? And, and she was supportive. And I was really surprised. I thought I'd get shot down right out of the gate. Right. You know? yeah. But uh, she said, if, if you think you can make a difference. You know, we need people that are willing to try to make a difference. So I, I kicked around for about four months. Uh, you know, I obviously got to get the company all positioned to right. carry on without me, which is part of what that ESOP transaction is about. And I think we're at that point and, uh, you know, I'm ramping up. I, I, yeah. I never honestly track politics all that. I'm like everyone else. I watch the news, right. you know, I, I have my conservative values, which I absolutely have. Those are not, you know, made up for tv i mean that's who i am you know yeah. and uh, so it fits really well with alabama because it's a very conservative state and uh you know in this state it's not about the general election it's about the primary right the primary when you you know you win the republican nomination because the republican nominee is almost certainly going to win it's, it's right it's failed to happen once in modern history here but uh should not happen this time right so you know, this is a this is a contest for the for the nomination, and that's what we're in the middle of right now. The primary is in May, and uh, and I'm in. I officially yeah. announced uh, two months ago, actually. And uh, I, uh, you know, there's mornings I wake up, why the heck did I do this? Honestly, I mean, I'm I'm a straight forward guy. I'm just going to yeah. tell you, it, if you don't wake up feeling that way, <laughs> then you, you are just different than me. You're you're yeah. you're a politician, which is not what I am. I mean, my right. whole platform is. I'm not a career politician. I'm bringing a career as a veteran, a career as a businessman, you know, somebody that's been in the real world that really understands the the implications of these decisions, not just in theory, but, right. you know, I've lived it. I know what, you know, raising the minimum wage, I'll just use that as an example. What does that really mean in the inner workings of a business? You right. know, in the end, where what, what is the output that, that, it comes as a result of that input. You know, things don't just happen and stop. There's right. always the second and third order effects that I don't think a lot of politicians truly understand because they haven't lived it. You know, they, they, they don't know how hard it is to find good workers. They don't know, you know, how, how important it is to keep them. And that's why, you know, right. one of the things I've spoken out so strongly against is the vaccine mandate as a federal contractor until the stay, the judge finally, you know, yeah. At least a judge ruled in our favor. But until that happened here recently, I was going to have to fire people that didn't want to get the vaccine. Right. And, and I'm vaccinated. I'm not anti-vax, yeah. but I am anti-mandatory vax because right. people, it shouldn't be forced on. I, I couldn't even allow them to test. I mean, that's that's the ridiculous part of that rule for federal contractors is I don't even have a testing option. I can't let them work from home. It's right. just such a ridiculous overreach. And I think one of the best examples of how incompetent are the current leadership we have in the White House is uh, in just their ignorance about what the, the implications of these decisions actually are. And then, you know, that's not even talking about Afghanistan, which right. I'm sure, you know, you and I could talk about for hours. But, you know, just poor, poor, poor decision making, poor management. And, you know, somebody's got to get in there and try to provide at least an outsider real world perspective to all this. Yeah, you know, you're you touch on so many different things, and I think you're a hundred percent right. Uh, it's really made me angry uh, as, as a business owner and as as a person that you know we employ seven hundred and fifty people here, and for the for the federal government to mandate something that I look at as is one, it's unethical and it's illegal in the context of you shouldn't be pulling me into your fight and making me part of this discussion as a business owner, because it's very illegal, as you know, as an employer to force any type of medical uh, circumstance on their employees or ask medical driven questions. <laughs> it's illegal. So for me, when I looked at this, I, I was like, this is coming from people that fundamentally misunderstand, I think, one, the law, uh, two, I think they, they fundamentally misunderstand business and 
if the Fed, if 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 if, if the White House wants to to mandate something, which honestly I think they they, they knew it didn't have a uh, have a chance in hell at pa- passing. I think this is just political posturing in, in its highest form. Uh, but it it takes a a complete lack of intelligence to understand how the economy is powered by some of these businesses and then implement something as I, I think, uh, for a lack of a better term, idiotic, because it really doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and I'm not anti-vax either whatsoever. I'm anti-federal government <laughs> mandating businesses to adhere to it. Now, if they want to say something to the DOD, if they want to tell the United States Army or the United States Marine Corps or whomever else, uh, you know, I don't know how many needles I had put in my arm over the course of, you know, a 20-year career between, you know, all the things that I couldn't actually pronounce. So I'm not necessarily against it. I'm just saying, like, you're a government employee. You're part of the military. That's their sh- that's that's part of their job and their responsibility. But as a business owner, I'm a private citizen, and I don't really want to be pulled into the conversation. It really makes me. Uh, it, it it just provides clarity to a complete disconnect between the business ownership and the White House. That's basically I, that's my rant for the day. But I couldn't agree no, with more. Hundred percent in sync. Hundred percent. And you know we have enough challenges already. I mean, yeah. we don't need more. It's, right. it, and, and it just added just more chaos to an already chaotic couple of years. Uh, you know, there's been so much, you know, I asked my, what I call it talent management, HR yeah. uh, president recently, give me an estimate of how much of your time is dedicated to just COVID and COVID related issues. And I thought she was going to say maybe 50 or 60. She said 80%. I mean, so this is a person who already had a full-time job, right. as you know, I mean, there's a lot too. Yeah, talent management, recruiting, and, and training, and right. you know benefits and everything else that goes along with that. And now I've taken eighty percent of her workday away and t- forced it to be focused on something else. And this just added to that. I mean, you know, because all the data collection and as you said, you know, a year ago you would have said, "Well, well, that's a HIPAA violation." You know, you yeah, can't, of course, you can't ask for that. You can't. <laughs> Yeah. And now if you don't provide it, you're going to get fired. This is ridiculous. Yeah. Crazy. Well, I, and so now they're, 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 they're somehow assuming control of your workforce and defining who can work and who can't, and then how they can work because of a, you know, a, a, so a, a safety regulation. I'm like, well, I have 90 people in customer service that work from home to your point that it doesn't make sense for me to, enforce a vaccine mandate for people that work at home in a non-social setting where they're not even in close proximity to one another. But it's that one size fits all government solution that, and when I tell people this all the time, my analogy is if the government was responsible for handing out shoes to all, you know, 300 plus million people in the United States, it would give you one size and it would fit about, we'll call it 5% of the American population exactly where they want to be. And then 95% of the people in the United States would be like, this thing doesn't fit worth a shit. So when we ask for the one size fits all federal solution, that's typically what we get. We get this kind of, it doesn't really fit, but it kind of fits for, you know, a smaller portion of the United States. But that's just me and my, my own uh, kind of political musing. I'm not, not running for office. I think the next thing that you touched on, which is I would love to get your perspective uh, and we don't have to like, you know, really rip apart the onion and make both of us cry. But when you watched what happened in Afghanistan, there's a, there's a lot of people that I think they started pointing the finger at the United States military. They started pointing the finger at the Pentagon. They started pointing the finger at the generals. Do you see this as a, as a general and Pentagon uh, responsibility or did you see this as, as something different? Well, you know, it's hard to say right. only at that senior level, because, yeah. you know, if, if, if the senior military leaders really assess the situation correctly, they would have mm-hmm. said, we can't do that, sir. I mean, th- this is going to be the result. And if you're asking me to do that, I'm going to have to resign. I mean, th- that would have been to me, the ultimate, you know, stand up, do right. what's right for the military. And that didn't happen as far as I know. I mean, no, yeah. no one did, did that. Yeah. 
So I can't, you can't say, you know, there's no stain on the senior military leadership. I mean, there has to be because no one right. took that stand. And that, I know that's asking a lot, uh, you know, but we asked hundreds of thousands of troops to deploy yeah. four th- and almost 4,000 American lives lost committed for 20 years to get to where we got and we threw it all away. And, and I, I have a little bit of a sense of how it feels because we did the same thing in Somalia. Right. 90 days after we departed, everybody we captured was released and we basically pulled everybody out and said, we're done here. Right. And, and, you know, you've been to the memorial services. You, I mean, it's completely throwing away the absolute sacrifice of all those amazing people. And, and again, it's another example of not getting it, you know, yeah. back to Somalia, Les Aspen was a secretary of defense and he, he took the fall for a lot of decisions that led to the, the way that mission played out and deservedly so. Right. And I happened to be there when he came to the memorial ceremony at Fort Bragg for the Delta operators. And I've always told people, I think the light finally came on for him when he walked into that room. Mm-hmm. I don't think he ever truly understood before that moment that these are real people, real families, children, parents, spouses. Their lives will never be the same. Right. And part of that responsibility is on him. And 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 I think there are a lot of people in office that don't they don't they, they can't really relate to it that way. And to them, it's this arbitrary thing that I don't want to say it's a game maybe, but they just, I don't think they've truly humanized it and, and it doesn't drive their decision-making because if it did, we wouldn't do a lot of things we do. It's completely disrespectful. And I, I'm just, I'm still angry about it. I, I, you know, I didn't deploy to Afghanistan. We did have a few folks there, you know, from a company perspective, which we were successful in getting them out. But, uh, I'm just, I'm more troubled by, you know, the, what we gave up. Yeah. W- would it have taken a while to turn the corner? Yes. But I, I think we were a lot better off uh, six months ago than we are today globally. Right. And, you know, and not even considering the impact of the Afghan people. I mean, it's just, just a travesty. Yeah. We, we, and we've talked, I've talked a lot about it on the show where I, I've asked the same thing which is this was such a catastrophic failure. Where are the resignations for uh, the people that are seeking responsibility or stepping up and taking responsibility? Because we should have seen a landslide of resignations on both sides, which is if you're asking us to do this, we can't ethically move forward and do it. And then on the other side, if people were taking accountability for it, they would have resigned out of, uh, out of one, we're taking responsibility for the failure and either getting terminated because if, if, if the way it works here, I, I mean, and I think you too in your business, which is if somebody has a catastrophic failure that they have planned and executed, you can't accept a certain amount of error. But if there's such a catastrophic error in, in judgment, coordination, and planning, you can't let that person stay in the same seat. You can't. It's It's actually unethical to the responsibility of the overall mission of the company. So when I look at it from a, a, a country's perspective, there's a combination of resignations that should have been on the, on the front end of that and on the back end, and there should have been a list of terminations because it was a catastrophic failure. And there wasn't. There just wasn't. So I think that just tells me that nobody sought responsibility. And when it's, I think that's like an army value. I believe, as long as, if I can remember, it's it's know yourself and seek responsibility, something like that. So nobody sought responsibility, and more importantly, nobody stepped up to say, "This is my failure. I did this." You didn't hear that. You know what you heard? You heard the veteran community. I think as a whole, the guys that served in Afghanistan, which you know I did, I was I was I'm very emotionally connected to it. We have Afghan commanders that actually work here at the company that we we I I deployed with in Afghanistan. We had a bunch of guys stepping up and saying, "I'll take responsibility. Like I'll, I'll take responsibility for trying to get my Afghan counterparts out. I'll take responsibility for trying to go over there as an individual on random aircraft and coordinate." 
people getting out. And I know there are some general officers that were directly responsible for that. But I think that was probably beyond the, the, the human aspect of the Afghan people. What was most disappointing was a lack of accountability. And that shows me that there is a big disconnect between the, the soldier that's serving and the Pentagon and the White House. There's a really, really big disconnect. I, and I don't know. I'm, 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 I guess I'm asking if, if you think that's, that's the case. And you kind of validated it earlier, but do you see that as, as a lack of accountability or do you see it as, as something different? No, I, I agree with you 100%. And I, again, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a lack of appreciation for yeah. the sacrifice. Right. You know, I think, I think it's hard to get into some people's heads, but yeah. they almost take it for granted. And, you know, it's, they don't humanize it. And right. I, 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 everything you said, I agree with 100%. And, and the fact that nobody, I think they view it as a victory. I mean, I, obviously in the White House, I think the White House views it as a victory, that we ended the war. And that's, that, that's the sound bite they want to put on it. And, you know, at whatever it costs doesn't matter because we got that sound bite. And, and you know, I, I, again, it's part of why I'm running. It's just to right. try to get in there and, and see if, uh, you know, it's an uphill grind. I know that. You know, everybody's told me, you know, well, half the people told me I'm nuts. But right. uh, if I can move the needle, I, I can't I can't not take the shot. What's the primary? What's what's the primaries look like for you? Who are you running? Yeah, not that I'm asking you to stump them, but uh, what's what's your competition look like? Uh, you know, do you have? Are are you ahead? Are you behind? Where are you out in polling? Do you know? So it's hard to say because I'm still fairly new in the race, but yeah. we're thinking I'm in second place right now. Okay. Uh, there's there's three of us really that are in the hunt. There's others, but they're not. They're right. Not, they're single digits. Uh, and, and we're a uh, runoff state. So if if there's three of us, it's probably going to go to runoff. So Got really, it. all I have to do is get second place in the election, right. get to the runoff, and then in, in the runoff, if, if, based on our analysis, I got a really good shot at winning. Right. Now, is there a series of debates that you'll have to participate in as far as the primary, or is it all basically uh, pull the handle and then you you continuing to move around the state of Alabama and something for yourself, or are you going to have an opportunity to get on stage and confront people with your ideas? Yeah, we, we do all of the above. I mean, yeah, it's not mandatory. It. Not, yeah. know, it's none of it you have to do, but it, you know, the more presence you have with the, with the voting base, the voter base, which is unique. You know, that's one thing I've learned. Uh, it isn't a general, it's a primary election. So yeah, it's yeah. a different group of people that, that we're, we're we want to make sure we, we reach out to and, and understand, you know, what I stand for. Uh, you know, if I was, if I was running in New York, I'd probably have no chance in hell of winning, <laughs> but, but you know, that's not who Alabama is. So, right. uh, I, uh, you know, so we've got ads running, we've got, uh, I've, I've gone out and done a few things. Uh, part of what put me behind a little bit in the timeline is I did have to button things up in the company here yeah. and, you know, like, you yourself, I'm sure, would say, uh, you know, if someone asked you to depart tomorrow, you would you would say, well, you know, I, I got great people working for me, but I, I probably need a little bit more time than that. <laughs> yeah, it'd take me it'd take me a few months. Probably take me 180 days to try to make that happen, even on the fastest scale. Yeah. Uh, so that's the timeline that I'm on. I, I really. And you know, if I don't win, I don't win. I took yeah. the shot. And one of my favorite quotes is "The man in the arena," which yeah. you're probably familiar with. You know, I mean. Yeah. It's nothing wrong with failing. You can't be afraid to fail. If no. you're afraid to fail, you're never going to realize your greatest potential. So uh, I'm kind of at another one of those moments in my life. I'm learning a lot. Uh, it's widening my aperture. Right. Uh, I mean, I have more educated uh, conversations with my high school senior who is really into government and really into history, which I never was right. before. So uh, I'm holding my own better <laughs> now. Uh, and, well you know what i'll uh i'll I'll keep stumping for you for the next uh several months before the primary and hopefully after i can't vote in alabama but i'll encourage everybody else to go out 
and one vote for vote for you in the primary, uh, you know, I, I can attest to the the medal of the the man. Clay can't can't say enough good things about you. I think your history speaks for itself. Where where can people go if they want to support you? Where can they go to donate money? Where can they go to support you? So we've got all the you know the Instagrams and everything else, oh, but yeah. the simplest place to go is just to the website mikedurant.com. So m i k e d u r a n t dot com. Uh, a lot of people put two R's in there, so there's not two R's, one R, uh, and it'll point you to wherever else you want to go if you're more of a Facebook or Instagram person. But it's all on there. And I uh, got a great team, and uh, you know we're up and running, and we're giving it a go. Well, I'll get in there. I, I just had my buddy Joe Kent. He's a retired Special Forces guy uh, on the show yesterday. He's running up in Washington. Uh, so I'm kind of doing the rounds for the special operations community who's running, who's in the field. I highly recommend you guys to go out and support You know the former special operations veterans like Mike. Uh, guys have astounding experience, I think, across business and military both. There's very few people on the planet, I think, can speak from the authority that Mike can. Uh, go out, donate 10, 20, 30 bucks, 100, whatever you got. Uh, let's try to put them in the race. So, or put them in the Senate. Let's do that. So thanks a lot, Mike. I really appreciate your time. Is there anything else we can, that uh, you want to part with? No, no, it was, it was awesome. I really enjoyed this and uh, I will get back to you on Panama because that sounds yeah. pretty interesting. And uh, I'll, I'll let Kurt know because he would probably be, I would love that. Unless he's PNG down there, I don't know. But uh. <laughs> I, I would love that. Well, let's let's uh, let's end, and then uh, we'll we'll you and I'll stay on for a minute, and we'll talk because I want to talk to you in thirty for a second. That concludes today's training. Any questions?